Is it on? Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you so much for coming to these back-to-back -back sessions, and, and um, I'm hoping that you can uh, you can still stay awake and and kind of take in this content, even though you didn't have a break in between. But um, we're going to talk about advanced .NET debugging. My name is Tess. Uh, I work as a developer at Microsoft. I used to work. Um, as a support engineer in the ASP.NET team a long, long time ago, where I would debug um, all sorts of issues for developers like us. Right now, I'm more um, debugging for myself and debugging for some of the product teams at Microsoft, but um, I'm still using the same techniques that I used to use back then. Part of what I've done also in, in my role was to improve the, the work or the debuggers that are included in Visual Studio, et cetera. But we're going to talk about not some, well, some parts of it is going to be Visual Studio, but most of it is not going to be Visual Studio. In fact, when I was talking to Dan North earlier uh, yesterday, I was, uh, he was asking me, what, what is it about this that makes it advanced.NET debugging compared to just, you know, normal.NET debugging? Well, in my book, it's because we're working on things that are very difficult to troubleshoot with the tools that we normally use to troubleshoot uh, .NET issues. So things like memory leaks, performance problems, crashes, all of these things. So things that you can't F5 debug, you can't step by step go through and figure out why you have a memory leak. Things that happen randomly, so maybe they'll happen today, but then it will take five days for it to happen again. Or things that happen on Linux or Mac, and you're developing on Windows, so you're, you don't have the same tool set available on, on the other machine where it's actually happening, where on the user's machine. Um, or maybe it happens in the cloud. So um, also there, you, might, you may not have Visual Studio or these tools available. So we'll talk about all of that, and we'll also sprinkle in some .NET internals into the mix. And we're going to start, this is going to be a very demo-heavy session. Um, but don't feel like you have to write down any of the commands or anything. I'll give you links in the end to, um, to kind of go through and, and see all the commands and, and figure things out. Um, what, I, what I do want to convey is more sort of like how the tools that we can use to troubleshoot these things and generally how to think about troubleshooting these things. So with high memory usage, you only kind of have to ask yourself two questions. What's using up the memory? So what are we using the memory for? And why the heck is it not going away? And that's what we're going to look at right now. So for this first example, I'm going to use a um, very simple .NET application. And I'm going to run it on, on Linux just to show that the tools I'm using are also very much working on Linux. But you can use the same tools on a Windows machine as well. So. This application is just a single loop that goes through and creates 10,000 product items. Sorry, please. Um, puts them in a list. So it's not necessarily leaking memory, because you can't really leak .NET memory in the same sense that you can do in a non-managed uh, language. You can't sort of like new something and then forget about the pointer to that. The garbage collector will always keep Attract and keep track of everything. So, but in this case, we're we're just using it up, and maybe we don't realize that we're using all that much. So, let's have a look at how this looks. So, I'm going to run .NET run, and let's see if I can increase the size a little bit here, maybe like that. Um, and this is just like I said, going to sit in a loop and and use up some memory. The first tool I'm going to use is a tool that you can install with .NET installs that's called .NET counters. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run a command on .NET counters called ps. So ps lists all the processes. And we see that our memory leak uh, item here is 1729. So we can then go ahead and run .NET counter to monitor this. Say monitor-p, 1729. 
And what this will do is it will do the equivalent of, if you've ever worked with performance counters or anything like that, it will really sit and listen and spit out a few performance counters. And if you can't really see in the back, um, some of the things that it spits out is um, you know, how much garbage collector heap we have, so how much .NET memory we use, how many garbage collections, how many assemblies, a couple of these things. So that when we watch these, and, and I go in here on the other side and I say leak some more, we can notice that, for example, this value, uh, which is like the GC committed bytes um, up here, went from 201 to 402. So that went from 200 megs to 400 megs. And if I were to do this one more time, it would increase by approximately the same size. So these are all these product items that I created that's now leaking in here. This is a tool that we can use just to kind of like check, check out what the, what the situation is. Are we leaking .NET memory? If we weren't seeing these kind of increases in, in the .NET memory, we would be looking at, so what else could we be leaking? And something else we could be leaking, for example, is if we use a COM component or something like a, a C++ component that allocates its own memory. Or we could be leaking assemblies we could have some kind of construct that would continuously load up dynamic assemblies, for example, like a regular expression or, or an XML serializer or something. But we have this. Um, and, oh, sorry, I was going to exit out of this one, but let's go ahead and run that one more time. And we'll do it three times. Yes, to have the same kind of situation. So the next tool I'm going to use is a tool called .NET uh, GC Dump. So .NET GC Dump is also a tool that you can install with .NET install and it runs on Windows, it runs on Linux. Um, and what it will do is it will take a snapshot of your .NET memory. So we can equally here do .NET GC Dump collect. And let's see if I remember what, what it was, 1729? Uh, well, I'll better do like PS <laughs> to see. Uh, oh, no, so we changed, we started a new process. So 1949. Uh, so .NET GC dump collect dash P 1949. So this will then generate a snapshot uh, with the extension GC dump. So literally this is just enumerating in the heap, figuring out like how many of each object you have and, and creating like a statistic list of them and the roots. So with this, what we can do now is we can open up Visual Studio and we can load this up. So now I'm running Visual Studio on my Windows machine, but it doesn't matter even though I got the GC dump from, from a Linux machine. So at least open this up. And I apologize, I can't zoom in on this, um, but what we have in here is we have a list of all the types of .NET objects we have. And we can sort them by count, or by size, or by inclusive size. So if we sort them by size, that means that we're going to look at what is using up the most amount of the memory. And one thing you need to know about .NET um, for, to understand sort of like the difference between size and inclusive size is that the size would only include the actual data that's in the product, but a product in this case is, is essentially just um, a list of um, pointers to, um, to different objects. So inclusive size is the size including any real data in there. So we look at inclusive size. So that makes sense. And that makes a difference, for example, here for the list of products, where the list of products only displays, um, you know, the list of products is only 525 bytes total, but it contains a lot of products. So inclusive size would be, be like that. But it doesn't really matter. We look at either one of them, and we might even look at the count. We might say, okay, so couldn't really find anything with the size, whatnot. The size will usually show a lot of strings and other like character arrays and things like that that are a little bit nondescript. But we can also look at the count because maybe we'll realize that 40,000 um, 40, products 
seems like a little bit excess excessive for this process I wasn't expecting to do to use that much. So then I would go in and I would click on this product and, and what this does, it will go through and say, who is holding on to this memory? And in this case, we can see that down here, it says that 39,999 of them are held on to by this array. So the reason why they stick around is because they are rooted in this array, um, this array of products. And then from there, I can troubleshoot a little bit. I can't troubleshoot much more here. I can't see, for example, any properties of the products or anything because I only have the statistics and, and the roots of them. But this, a lot of times, get us as far as we need. Also, one thing I want to mention about this is I use the tool GC Dump now. But if you are, in fact, F5 debugging and you want to do this thing where you want to look at what, what type of objects you have in your, in your process, you can also go in and create a snapshot in diagnostic tools in, in Visual Studio, and that will generate the exact same thing. You can also create multiple snapshots, compare them to see if a certain item has has gotten like if you've leaked or if you've used more of a certain type of item or not. But this is the first, the first tool that, that could be useful. Um, next, I'm going to use another tool um, that's called GC Dump. So what GC Dump does is it creates a memory dump of the process. So this doesn't only create the statistics, but it creates a memory dump of all the memory that the process uses, including, uh, in this case, uh, G and .NET dump only takes the managed memory. It doesn't um, understand much about native uh, memory, but we, we will have things like we can actually go in and look at the details about what some of these things are. So I'm going to exit out of this one, I think. Mm. For some reason, I've had an issue lately with, um, with Windows Terminal where it's not really cooperating on after I clicked Control C. So we'll go. Uh, so we can now, we created the, um, the memory dump, um, which is like this core dump on Linux. We can now go in and run .NET dump again. Um, see .NET dump, um, but in this case, we're going to do analyze. So it's both a collector and a tool to actually debug memory dumps with. So analyze, and we're going to analyze this memory dump. And this puts us in a place where we can run a number of commands. And then commands we can run, you can see by help. So a couple of the commands that we can run are, for example, um, looking at the CLR stack, so looking at the .NET stacks of the threads, or, or looking at the memory used, and things like that. So if I go in and run one of the commands, which is E version, I will see that this is a process that was running uh, .NET 6.0. Um, it was running in workstation mode. So workstation mode is one of the modes that you run the garbage collector in. Uh, we have workstation and server. Uh, where workstation mode is meant for things like console apps and things like that that don't, don't have a lot of concurrent requests coming in. Where server mode is something you would run in, in, on a web server where you have a lot of concurrent requests and you have one garbage collector thread per heap or sorry, per, per processor per processor or per, um, per core, if you will. Uh, and they behave a little bit differently. So the workstation is a bit more blocking, but it doesn't block the UI thread. The, the server mode tries to, to coordinate, then in my case, eight different uh, GC threads. We'll see that in a bit. Uh, I can run eheap-gc. All of these commands come from a tool called SOS, which is um, short for Son of Strike, where this was something that me and my team worked on a long, long time ago on uh, making .NET more debuggable. Um, and Son of Strike is um, an extension of another tool that was called Strike 
for strike the lightning in the very old days. And um, when I worked, <laughs> when I worked in support, I, .NET was called DNA and Lightning, like the BCL, like the base class libraries versus the, the runtime were called DNA and Lightning. And Strike was, was just so we could sort of like run this rudimentary debugging on, on .NET. So it's a little history lesson that ages me a lot, <laughs> I think. But what this does, this eheap-gc that I ran, um, it lists out all of the heaps in, in .NET. So uh, all the different segments that the garbage collector allocates. I'll talk a little bit about how that works later. But for now, um, we want to look at this. So this is the 808 megabytes that we've committed for .NET. So we can clearly see that it is a .NET problem, even if we didn't have GC dump and all that, or counters. And we can run dump heap um, dash stat. And this will give the statistics that is very, very similar to what we saw in Visual Studio. And lowest here is, uh, is the one that's using up the most memory. We can see that um, we, in fact, have um, 40,000 uh, products. Uh, in this case, only the link size, sizes are shown. Um, and the way I would look at something like this is I would go from the bottom and I would go like, OK, so characters or, character or race are very nondescript. I don't know uh, what they belong to, strings. OK, but I see this product. That's something I can work with and something I can kind of like reason about whether or not that's a reasonable number of these. And then I would go in and I would uh, take this first column and I would run dump heap dash mt. So the first column is called a method table. That's a descriptor for how this object looks, what methods you can call on it, what the class is, and so on. And this dumps out all the objects of that type. So these are the addresses of all the objects. I can go in then and pick out one of the addresses. I don't know why. Let's see if that worked. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. This is not <laughs> it's very hard if I'm going to have to um, uh, if I'm going to have to actually write <laughs> the the address of that. So let's see if we can get this working one more time. Dump heap stat. We're getting the objects, and then copying out the product. Now I can run another command that's called dump obj, or if you want to, you can just run do for, for short. And what this will do is it will dump out the actual product object, so as you would see it in Visual Studio if you were stopped. So we can see things like if we continue to dump out like the name, for example, we can see that name is product 9992. So this was some string that I had filled in. And like when I created them in the loop, I named them product in, in the index. So here we can do a little bit more reasoning about like, okay, so I can, if I dump out a few of these and I see that they, all of the ones that I have have these properties, maybe that will give me some clues on why I'm holding on to them. And then I can also do um, GC root on this. And GC root will then do exactly what um, the GC dump thing did, where it will show me the roots of what's going on. So in this case, it tells me that that string I was doing GC root on is a member variable of product, that's part of a list. In fact, array is the internal implementation of a list. And that is held onto by thread 79D. So if I move to threads, and I see 79D happens to be the one we're on, uh, marked by a star. And if I do CLR stack, so I see the stack here, I can see that this is the main, um, the main function of the class. It's sitting in a read line. And this is sort of like the thread that's still holding onto the list. So basically, this is just um, a quick 
how you would go through these kind of memory issues. So um, we looked at .NET counters, .NET dump, .NET GC dump. And if you want to go through this and try it out for yourself, I do have them, this and, and everything else I'm going to go through on my blog. And uh, specifically, this walkthrough is available, like that's the last um, one I, last post I, I have in there, with all the different commands and, and a video and, and all of these things. So don't worry about having to, to actually remember all of these things. But I also have a set of labs on there. So the set of labs um, is something you know, like you can download a very bad application and you can try to troubleshoot these things by yourself with different prompts. Okay, so why would we keep memory hanging around? Well, um, the only thing that keeps memory hanging around is if, if the object is not getting ready to, or it's not being ready to be garbage collected yet. And the things that could keep memory around are threads, so it's still being used on the thread, on the stack, whatnot. If you have a static object, if you have cache, which is like a, an, a subset of static objects, if you pin it or span it, um, or if it's locked by the finalizer queue. So we're going to look at a, a situation where the finalizer queue blocks it. Oh, thank you. Um, in a second. But before we go into that, let's talk a little bit about memory management in, uh, in .NET. So I mentioned and we saw in the eHeap GC um, that we have something called segments. So as opposed to, for example, C++, we don't allocate the memory ourselves. we use a garbage collector. And a garbage collector, whether it's C Sharp or whether it's Python or Java or JavaScript, they all essentially work a little bit the same way. So what I'm showing you here is going to be roughly equal on all of them uh, with a few implementation details. Um, but you can think of it as, um, instead of you allocating them, if you go to a restaurant, if they allocated like a super big table and you just get seated at the table. So you come into the restaurant and you get seated, the more you allocate objects, the more the more you start filling up the table. And then you get to a point where you reach a limit. Um, and the limit is, uh, I'll talk a little bit about generations and things like that. But one limit, for example, is when you reach the end of a segment. And at that point, you need to garbage collect. So what you do is you go through and you ask, anyone ready? Um, OK, so these guys are, are done eating. We can then mark them as done, sweep things, and compact. Um, the memory. So we then have more space on this segment. We continue allocating more memory. Eventually, we'll get to a point where we can't actually allocate any more memory on this segment. So we'll start creating more and more segments like this. And that's simply how memory management works in, in a garbage collected world. So mark, sweep, and compact are these phases. We do have, though, something called generations. And the generations are uh, what, we, what we use sort of to optimize how the garbage collector works. So generation zero are things that are very current. So these might be uh, things that you're using in your current um, function or things that you just recently used. Anything that fits um, into L2 cache. So as soon as you reach the limit, which is your CPU cache, we start uh, collecting the first generation. Um, so the reason why, why this is an optimization is because anything that you allocated recently is probably something that you will use very close to now. Where something that you've used or that you allocated a long time ago, something that's in cache or something uh, that's a little bit more long-term storage, you probably don't use as often. So it doesn't matter if you have to sort of like swap things in and out of, of the CPU. But if for some reason it survives this, so if, if you go through and you're not done when it's doing collection, you turn it into generation one. So you put it in a little bit more long-term storage than your, your current work. And then eventually 
when you allocate uh, enough for the generation one uh, to be filled, then it will move into generation two, which is your, um, like that's the last generation that exists. So generation two collections are very expensive compared to generation zero collections. Generation zero collections happen like this. They happen very often. And generation two collections happen very more seldom, when much more seldom, but when they do happen, they cost more. Um, so let's have a look at how, how this looks inside um, the memory dump. So let's go ahead and open this up again. And we'll look at eheap-gc. And we'll see these are the segments that we have uh, right here. So we have a set of segments. Uh, if we look at one of them, for example, like this one. So we'll do dump heap from here to where it was. Ah, <laughs> what did I do? Here. To where it was allocated. We'll see that. This is in fact how this looks, as in it, they're allocated like one after another, all of these objects. And if we were to dump them out, we could, but um, what, we, what we can see from this is that objects on, on the .NET heap are immutable in the sense that you cannot grow an object, you cannot grow a string, for example, you would have to create a new string because if you did grow a string, there wouldn't be space for it because there's something tacked on right after it, right? So that means that, as we'll see in a bit, if you do happen to do something where you think you're gonna uh, just expand something but you don't, that's gonna lead to trouble. But let's go ahead and, and have a look at another memory leak. By the way, if you're interested in, in the details of how memory management works and everything, Maone, who's the um, architect of the GC, she's got this and a number of other documents that's um, very good explanations both of how memory management work and what you can do to, to make sure that your uh, applications are more performant. So, let's go and have a look at another um, issue with high memory usage. In this case, I'm, I'm not going to capture the dump. Like I could capture the dump either through, <clears throat> through using GC dump or I could go in on any process and say create a dump file. This is also a valid way to create a memory dump of like any, it doesn't have to be your process. Um, as long as you're either running it or you have privileges. Uh, higher than the person who's running it on your system. Um, and there's also a number of different tools that you can use to create these memory dumps. But I've already created one, and I'm going to load it up here. So this is a tool called WinDBG. And WinDBG is, um, is a native debugger. So that means that um, it doesn't only understand uh, it doesn't only understand .NET memory, but it also understands um, other things like Windows calls and the drivers and everything that's underneath it. It's not kernel, so it doesn't actually go in. The drivers is still a user mode dump, which means it's only the process itself, but it understands like the underlying things. Like if we, if we look at a thread, you'll see that it's like NTDLL and the starts of, of things like that. So we're gonna run through the exact same scenario here though, we're going to do um, E version. And in this case, we're going to see that we're actually running in server mode. This is from a website. So server mode with eight heaps will run E heap and dash GC. Find out that we're using 200 megs of, of memory. So that's what we're kind of dealing with and what we want to dissect. And then we'll do dump heap stat to understand what the objects are that we're loading up. If you're a little bit attentive and if you can see uh, what I'm writing on the screen, like you'll see that there's an exclamation mark in here that wasn't there in the uh, .NET dump case. This is because in this case I'm running SOS as, an ex as a, a, a DLL module that Windows 
uh, WinWG uses. So, uh, whereas the commands are built in to GC dump. But in here we can see, if we look from the bottom, um, a similar scenario where we have, you know, some character surveys, strings, string builders, whatnot. And then eventually we run up here and we see um, some of my own things, um, a link, and we have 8,000 of them. And I then go in and say, okay, so that seems a little bit fishy. I go in, in this case, I can run all the same commands like dump heap MT and everything, or I can also click on the links here. It's using something called the bugger markup language. That is, when you click, it's actually running a dump obj or a dump heap in this case. So I'm listing out all the all these links, and I go through the exact same scenario. I go open one up, for example, which is dump obj. And I click on this, which does another dump obj, and we can see that in this case it's called like Nico's weblog was some text that was in this link, but I want to know why this is uh, being kept alive, so I do gc root, and when I go through and do gc root, uh, there's a long <laughs> list of things. I'll, I'll pick another one, maybe that's an easier one. I'll see that it's locked by, or it's used by something called a finalizer queue. So the finalizer queue is one of the garbage collector threads, if we look here, that is specifically dedicated to only calling your destructor. So if you have a destructor on your object, if you're trying to release some kind of native memory or handles or, or whatever you might have, you might have a destructor, and this thread is the only one who's allowed to run destructors. What that means is that if you have an object that uses a destructor, whether or not it's empty, it will in fact cause your, your object to at least survive generation zero because it has to do survive it, mark it for a deletion, finalize it, and then garbage collect it. And in this case, the reason why it's sticking around or why, um, why we're seeing this memory leak is because if we were to, if we look at the finalizer, and this is something like whenever you see something that's rooted in the finalized queue, you would go in and look at the thread and run CLR stack. And in this case, it's sitting in a sleep. Now, obviously, this is um, yes, something that I'm doing kind of like to to cause a problem, but you can imagine it would be stuck, for example, and doing like trying to release a handle, something that's taking a lot of time. Even if it just takes a little bit of time, if you release a lot of them, then it would take a lot of time to, to release all of them. Okay, so um, that is an example of a memory leak um, on the finalizer uh, queue. So um, this is, and this is just, if you have one of these um, empty destructors, you will run into to a situation and when you survive too many times. So we used uh, WinWG. Internally, this uses .NET SOS and .NET symbols. Uh, you can also install these with, with .NET tools. So one thing we haven't talked about yet when it comes to the garbage collector is, is the elephant in the room, which is a large object heap. So the large object heap is a special heap, um, sort of like a special set of segments that are meant for very large objects. So any objects that are over 85,000 bytes. For example, um, lists that are very large or, or strings that are very large, etc. And this is another optimization of the garbage collector where because we don't want to constantly move a list of of 85,000 85, objects, because that would mean that we would have to move a lot of things. We're putting them on a separate table, and um, we're garbage collecting them as normal, but when we do garbage collect the large object heap, we don't only garbage collect the large object heap, we do a full generation two collection. So that means that 
if you're doing a lot of allocations on the large object heap, you will eventually end up exhausting the segment, making a, a, large, a garbage collection of the large object heap, which then induces a generation two ex, uh, collection, which is fairly expensive. So if you keep doing this, you'll end up in a very bad pattern that's causing a lot of bad CPU usage, which takes us to bad performance. So bad performance, um, when we troubleshoot a problem with bad performance, we're looking at why is it taking so long and what are we doing? These are really the only two questions we, we should concern ourselves with when it comes to, to bad performance problems. So let's go ahead and, and have a look at how we can troubleshoot something like this. So in this case, I have a website running in Azure. Um, and it's showing like high CPU usage from time to time, very bad response times, whatnot. And what I can do in here, I can go in and click on this, uh, which is available on all uh, most services in, in .NET actually, or sorry, in Azure, um, which is diagnose and solve the problem. And this has a number of different things. It allows you to do tracing or, or logging or a lot of, things including um, these diagnostic tools that allow you to pick uh, memory dumps. So this is a way that you can create or collect memory dumps in, uh, in Azure. The back end of this tool or what's, what's behind this tool is something called debug diag. So debug diag is a tool that you can also run locally on your machine and you can equally use that to to collect, for example, memory dumps when, uh, when CPU is very high or when something is crashing or under various different conditions. And then it's also an analysis tool. So this is something we created in, in a support um, where we got very tired of, of troubleshooting the same kind of problems over and over and over and over again. So we created these scripts that would sort of like check through the most common things and then uh, generate a report for you telling you what um, what the problem probably was. So if you go in and do collect and analyze data, this is what's running in the background. So I have a memory dump from this um, that I took before, and I'll open it up and start the analysis. So now it's going through, if I were to run, for example, the memory analysis, it would then go through and run dump heap stat, GC root, like all of these things, and it will tell me, you know, you're like categorize the objects by color, by type a little bit, and, and give you some heuristics about what it, what it thinks. And then it would uh, show you one of these reports, and uh, the analysis summary. Now, the, the fact that this is running like MHTML and and it's like more IE-like kind of tells you how old this is, but it's still something that's very functional. Like even last month, I could run this and actually come up with what, 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 was the, what the problem was in, in one, of the trouble, one of the things we were troubleshooting. So this here tells us, for example, that we, we are running the garbage collector when the, when the memory dump is taken. It also gives you some links, and these are links to my blog um, for the different labs and different uh, troubleshooting examples. And um, it also tells us in here that um, it's working on um, it's working on uh, concatenating strings. But let's go ahead and uh, let just click on the link and see the stack. So this would be the equivalent of running CLR stack. Um, so we can see here that our products controller is calling concat. And this is a very well-known, very bad pattern um, in .NET. So what this is doing is, uh, if I bring up, let's bring up Notepad. So if you imagine you have a string hello, and then you wanted to run, you wanted to only add, uh, you wanted to add world, but you add um, one character at a time. Then the first string that you would create would look like this. And then 
when you added on the O, you would have to create a new string. Because of how the objects are sort of like stacked one after another, strings are immutable so they can't grow, and this, this causes you to then allocate a lot more. Now, what's happening here is that um, we see a lot of CPU and garbage collection because if we go to the products controller in here, and we look at the index, we'll see that what it's actually doing is it's bringing down all the products, and then it creates like this HTML table of all the products, and this gets very big. Like, so we're just tacking on one row at a time, but we're now creating something like, you know, a thousand strings that end up being over 85,000 bytes. So what are we doing? We're exhausting the large object heap, and we're starting to generate a lot, a lot, a lot of generation two collections. And this will cause very high CPU usage. So this is um, a pattern that you should avoid if you're creating very large strings. It doesn't really matter if you're just doing sort of like small strings and you're concatenating three, th three strings, then by all means use, use like the plus signs and concatenate them together. But if you're doing something like this where you're maybe generating a JSON or you're generating some kind of output, then use a string builder instead because the string builder can, will allocate an array, pre-allocate an array, and then once that array is full, it will create an array of double the size. So while in, in, in some cases it will create a lot bigger array than it needs, it will definitely not create a lot of different arrays because it will grow sort of by double all the time and it will maybe, something like this would be generating, I don't know, maybe five allocations versus the 10,000 allocations that the concatenation generates. Okay, so that is troubleshooting um, a high CPU usage problem. Um, so let's go ahead and look at another problem, which is a low CPU usage problem. So in a high CPU usage problem, the process is actually doing something and, and it's constantly sharing. So when you have a high CPU usage problem, it's normally the GC, a runaway loop, or regular expressions. Like those are usually the, the things that will generate like, you know, these 100% CPU type situations. With low CPU problems, instead what you have is a process that's actually waiting for something else. Maybe it's waiting for a database, maybe it's waiting for an API, it's some other process, but this process is actually not working much. It's just, you know, using up threads. So again, I captured a memory dump from, uh, from a process. And in this case, I'm gonna use another tool that most of you know, uh, Visual Studio to debug this memory dump. So I'm gonna open up the memory dump um, in here. So let's see. And what we have here is we have a little bit of information about the memory dump. Like again, it's using .NET 6, uh, it's running on Windows 11. It's just Windows 10, but it's actually Windows 11. Um, and you can choose to either debug with managed, native, or mixed. And in this case, we're gonna use debug with managed, um, which is only the .NET part. We don't care about like the, the native parts on the stacks. And you end up in, in this situation because we don't, this is a server, so this will show the active thread, which is usually um, thread zero when you, when you capture a dump unless you're in a crash or something, in which case it will show you the active thread. But we have a lot of other threads that are executing requests because this is a web server. So what we can do is we can go in and use uh, parallel stacks. And parallel stacks is not something that's only used with memory dumps. It's something that you can very much also use in Visual Studio when you debug things to see what the other threads are working on, the ones that and that you're not necessarily debugging right now. And it has this neat feature of taking all the threads 
and kind of like extracting the common parts of what the threads are working on. So what we're seeing here is that we have our main, which was on, on the first thread, but we then have a number of, of threads, 11 of them, all sitting in this products controller featured function, um, going into some data layer um, and calling some function there. And then out of these 10, nine, actually one of them is waiting for a thread to, um, to be free. So we have 11 requests, but one of them need, like we only have, we can only have 10 concurrent with the settings. So it's waiting for, for the others to be released. But out of these threads that we're actually working, uh, one of, nine of them are waiting on a lock and one of them are in, is in a lock. And because I've grabbed this on the same machine where I was or where I have the code, or you also, this also works if you have symbols and you have the code lined up exactly as the code that's running on the, on the server, you can go in and click and it will take you, I'm sorry, it then activates what thread you're on and, let's see, I'll do this one more time. Here, and it pulls you exactly where, where this particular thread is sitting. So in this case, we, we can go in and we can see that the actual issue and what these threads are working on is actually, you know, sitting in, in this case, in a sleep, simulating a, a long running request while holding a lock. And that's why the other, the other threads are, are waiting. So I find this very useful if you have the code and everything. And even if you don't have the code, just looking at the parallel stacks is quite a nice view, especially if you're not super into debugging with WinDBG, this is at least, you know, looking at it from a familiar place where, where you're normally at. Okay, so that was reviewing a, a low CPU issue. And all of the dumps that we've taken so far, you could have also done this same thing with. So we use debug diag in the background, which is Azure Diagnostics, but you can download and use the debug diag um, locally and Visual Studio for memory dump debugging. So the last thing we're gonna have a look at super, super quick is crashes and exceptions. So if we have a process that crashed, the only thing we're really concerned with is what the heck just happened? Like, so what, what caused the crash? And I'm gonna use the same uh, use Visual Studio in this case also to, to debug it. Now, one thing I do want to mention, when you capture a dump of a memory leak or of a process or of a performance issue, you can just go in into task manager or you can run GC dump and all of these things because you take a snapshot of the process right now when it's happening. For something like a crash, it's not possible to catch it in the act. Like you would have to be super, super fast and very, very accurate with your timing to catch it in the act. So instead we have to run something like debug diag and set it up so that it will catch a memory dump when it crashes, or proc dump uh, from sysinternals internal, sys is also, or Windows error reporting. So Windows error reporting you can set up also to, to capture dumps of any process that crashes, and it will, it will then collect the dumps from you, for you that you can troubleshoot like this. So let's have a look at how that looks. Uh, I'm gonna stop this. And and I'm gonna do the same thing, debug with managed. I'll go ahead and kill these parallel stacks because now, because it was a crash dump, it took me to the very place where it was crashing. So this was a null reference exception. Um, because this is a native dump, it shows it as an access violation. But you can see here that just like as if you were debugging something live, you can see the code, you can see things like um, the objects and their values. So you can hover over them. The only thing you can't do is you can't move forward because this is still a snapshot, so you can't like it's not a live debugging session, you can't, uh, you can't kind of carry on from here, but, but at least it gives you a very good tool and a very 
in my book at least, a comfortable tool to work with for troubleshooting these things. Um, and again, the reason why we would use a dump here is because maybe it doesn't happen when you try to step-by-step -step debug, or maybe it happens on someone else's machine. And that kind of concludes um, this, but I hope you got enough out of this um, in terms of tools and techniques to go and troubleshoot them on your own, but as I said, uh, if you're looking to try them out before you have your own problem, or if you're looking to sort of get references on, on how to do these, um, these labs are, are pretty okay for that, I think. So, thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day moving on. <laughs>